Okay, so let's continue. I think I'm gonna go back to Word. I feel more comfortable. It's more convenient for what I need. So in this course, we focus only on inertial reference frames and we only see invariance of laws amongst all the inertial frames. So automatically Newton's first law works in such frames since by definition, the way that uh, we defined it in this course, uh, inertial frames are the ones in which Newton's first law works. So in these frames, an object that's left alone remains at rest or continues to move uh, uniformly. Okay, so, okay, so that's Newton's first law. Okay. Object not subjected to force. Force. Um, space. Rest. Or remains in motion. With a constant velocity. Okay. So what happens if object is not left alone, i.e., if there is a force, or uh, equivalently, if it's interacting with something? Well, then they will no longer uh, move in a straight line at constant speed, i.e., they will accelerate. And so, my question to you is: if you had to guess. Okay, if you only knew for Newton's first law, and you had to guess, what's the simplest relationship between force, push or pull, uh, measure of interaction, and acceleration is? Okay, so. So if you had to guess and you didn't know what it is, simplest. The simplest guess you could possibly make is that, well, acceleration is proportional to the force. Not force squared, not sine of force, not hyperbolic cotangent of force, but simply force itself. And guess what? That simplest guess is the one that it actually is. Okay? The simplest, hands down, the simplest possible relationship between the force and acceleration that you can come up with is what it actually is in nature. Nature gives us the simplest possible uh, set of laws of motion that's possible being redundant to this. <clears throat> so I bet you've never thought of it that way uh, when you were taking this one. It was a source of major headache. It could have been a headache, but it's as simple as it could possibly be. Imagine if it was proportional to f squared or something like that, it would be even more of a headache. I will make a separate optional video in which I confirm that Newton's second law is Galilean invariant. In other words, it's also consistent with principle of relativity in the Galilean sense. Um, but I will bypass that here. I will just state that as a fact. Okay. And so, in contrast to how Phys 1 students see it, Newtonian mechanics is an elegant body of ideas that's completely consistent with principle of relativity. We saw an example yesterday with momentum conservation, and I just made a claim uh, that Newton's second law, F equals ma, is also, uh, also a base principle of relativity. Okay, so it's not a random set of ad hoc formulas, uh, but on the, contact, on the contrary, it's the simplest set of laws of motion imaginable uh, that's consistent with most basic symmetry idea, principle of relativity. 
And it's appealing not only for this reason, but because it has an enormous predictive power, obviously. Newton's laws explain, the re explain uh, with remarkable precision phenomena that range from crawling bacteria to bicycles to body mechanics to motion of airplanes and rockets to the formation of new stellar, stellar systems. And it was, I think it was a principal driver behind the Industrial Revolution and, as a consequence, uh, you. And it's all described by um, uh, the simplest set of ideas that are uh, allowable by principle of relativity. So this was the state of things up until mid-19th century. And then something happened. Something happened. A new body of laws appeared on the stage for a whole new set of phenomena. But what are they? You can probably guess that these were laws that governed electrical and magnetic uh, phenomena. And it's now virtually impossible to imagine your life without uh, electromagnetism. Yet it could all be summarized in a compact set of four equations that, known as Maxwell's equations. Um, and these are, since a lot of you are electrical engineers, you should know what these are. A Gauss's law. There's also an equivalent of Gauss's law for magnetism. Uh, Ampere's law and my favorite Faraday's law, uh, which explains everything from how hybrid cars operate to how your electricity is generated in the world. It's a theory of amazing beauty and internal consistency. Okay. But what's the first thing we should do when presented with a brand new law of nature? By now, you should know we check if they obey principle of relativity. And back then, it was understood in the sense of Galilean invariance. If something is Galilean invariant, that means uh, it obeys principle of relativity, or so they thought. So when we do that, when we take Maxwell's equations and we do an operation similar to what I did with momentum conservation. It's more advanced because uh, these are field equations, but same idea. Well, guess what? They are not Galilean invariant. So this was a big uh, bummer, a big disappointment. Okay, and so back in, in those times, it was assumed to mean that, that they do not obey principle of relativity. Okay, not good. Well, so then they just, why, why not reject Maxwell's equations? Well, because they predicted all experiments in electrodynamics with remarkable accuracy, and they did something else. It's not enough to explain things. Uh, if you have a theory that explains something in a backhanded way, that's a, a useless theory. But when it predicts something new and then you go to the lab and you check it and you find that that's indeed a correct prediction, now that's a, a powerful theory. It has a predictive power. And so they said that electromagnetic phenomena, that they said that light, was actually electromagnetic phenomenon, was a new idea. And it predicted the, the correct speed of light, which could be checked independently. Uh, in fact, it was already known from early, much earlier experiments, non-EMM type of experiments. So Maxwell's equations had to be taken seriously, but now we have this dissonance, okay? Something had to, had to be done about the uncomfortable fact that did, they did not appear to be Galilean invariant, and therefore apparently violating principle of relativity. Or do they? So how do we resolve this tension? So the resolution had to wait for 40 years. In the meantime, people tried to come up with a patchwork of solutions, um, all proven to be a failure, and uh, 
only a completely revolutionary look at the most basic things uh, is what eventually saved the day uh, in early 20th century. And we will come back to that discussion. But first, we're going to need to take a detour. And we will talk about something seemingly unrelated. We will talk about sound. Um, we will do an exercise. We'll work out a problem related to sound. And then when we uh, go back to light and we state Einstein's postulates, we will repeat that exercise with light and we will see that there's a fundamental difference and uh, we'll, uh, it will help us to digest what's going on. Okay, so this is the end of part two. And I will see you again soon.